The English Electric Lightning is one of the most intriguing combat jets of the First Cold War. It was ugly as hell, but also heavenly charming. This fighter was extraordinary in every way. Today, we're investigating the Lightning, the first and last purely British Mark II combat jet. The Lightning is an unusual fighter with its story, design and performance. It represents a turning point in not only the British aviation industry, but also the empire on which the sun never set. To better understand this jet, we should look at the situation in Great Britain after the Second World War. When the Japanese Empire surrendered on September 2, 1945, the citizens of the UK celebrated the victory as one of the winners. The British Armed Forces was at the peak in its history regarding its size and combat capability. Yet, being at the peak also means the beginning of the downfall. The Second World War had devastated the British economy. Besides, decolonization was now inevitable. Yet, the Brits still had faith that they could stop the sun from setting. So, the UK, one of the pioneers of the jet era, had already begun to work on a supersonic aircraft as early as 1943. However, due to budgetary reasons, the Miles M52 project was cancelled just after the Second World War. Later, even though the UK built a three-tenth scale unmanned model of this aircraft and broke the sand barrier on October 10, 1948, the Bell X-1 had already become the first supersonic manned aircraft on October 14, 1947. Yet, the UK had also issued the specification ER-103 for a supersonic fighter in 1947. English Electric immediately approached the Ministry of Supply for a single research aircraft. On March 29, 1949, the UK approved the detailed design and development phase for wind tunnel models and a full-size mock-up. This aircraft, which took many design cues from the CAC CA-23 of Australia, was not alone. It would compete with the Ferries Delta II. In the same year, the Ministry of Supply changed the requirements. The research aircraft should also have had fighter-level maneuvering capability. On April 1, 1950, the UK awarded English Electric a contract for two flying and one static airframes. The aircraft was now called the P-1. Since the P-1 was designed as a supersonic research aircraft, English Electric's engineers did not focus on the low-speed handling capability. It caused a technical dispute between the Royal Aircraft Establishment and the company about the optimum configuration for the aircraft. So, the Ministry of Supply awarded Short Brothers with a contract to develop the SB-5 to assess the effects of wing sweep and tailplane position on the stability and control of the P-1. After all these works, English Electric began to build the first three prototypes in 1953. However, aviation technologies were advancing faster than the British efforts. The leading countries had already begun to work on the new Mach 2 fighters. So, one year before the construction of the P-1's first three prototypes, the UK had ordered three additional aircraft with Mach 2 speed. The first three were redesignated as the P-1A and the following three as the P-1B. Unlike its predecessor, the P-1B would have extensive alterations to the forward fuselage, afterburning R24 R engines, a conical center body inlet cone, variable nozzle reheat, and provision for weapon systems integrated with an air data computer and an AI-23 radar. The P-1A made its maiden flight on August 4, 1954. Initially, it had been planned to be equipped with the Rolls-Royce A-1 engines. However, Due to the delay in the development of the A-1, the P-1A met the sky with non-afterburning Armstrong Sidley Sapphire turbojets. The P-1B made its maiden flight on April 4, 1957. It was also the second Western European aircraft in this class after the French Dassault Mirage III. Thus, the UK proved it was still in the race in the aerospace industry. However, another race, the nuclear weapon race, turned the P-1 research aircraft program into an actual fighter jet development project. In the early stages of the First Cold War, the UK realized it would be impossible to intercept all Soviet nuclear bombers before they would reach the British mainland in a possible Third World War. 
So, it decided to have nuclear strike capability for threats of retaliation to deter the USSR. The V-bombers, the Valiant, Vulcan and Victor were created for this job. During the 1950s, these aircraft were the essential trump of the UK against the USSR, which also made them the prior targets for the Soviet nuclear bombers. The Royal Air Force had to keep its V-bombers airborne to protect them from a sneak attack, as the US Strategic Air Command did. However, it was quickly realized that continuous airborne patrols would be untenable. Also, the UK could not afford the economic burden of such deployment. Thus, the V-bombers began to wait at high readiness to be airborne in under 4 minutes in case of a war. Yet the Royal Air Force had to protect these aircraft bases from a sneak attack. It needed a highly capable interceptor alongside the surface-to-air missiles. The P-1A was already flying and the P-1B would meet the sky soon. Besides, the aircraft of English Electric could be operational much before Bloodhound 2 missiles. So it was perfect to fill the immediate need for a supersonic interceptor of the Royal Air Force, which made a research aircraft program into a frontline fighter development project. In 1958, the aircraft was officially named Lightning. The first production variant, the Lightning F-1, entered the Royal Air Force Service in 1960, which made it the second Western European-built combat aircraft with true supersonic capability in service after the Swedish Saab 35 Draken. After English Electric merged with some other British aerospace companies to form the British Aircraft Corporation, it was marketed as the BAC Lightning. Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and the UK were the operators. Kuwait replaced the Lightning with the Mirage F-1 in 1977. The F-5s replaced the Saudi Lightnings in ground attack roles, while the F-15s and Tornado ADVs in interception roles in 1986. The Royal Air Force retired the aircraft in 1988. First, Phantom FGR-1s and FGR-2s, and then the Tornado F-3s relieved the Lightnings from their duties. The Lightning F-6 variant had a length of 16.84 meters, a wingspan of 10.62 meters, and a height of 5.97 meters. Its wing area was 44.08 square meters. The aircraft's empty weight was over 14,090 kilograms, while its maximum takeoff weight was over 20,750 kilograms. One 72.8 kN Rolls-Royce A1-301R afterburning turbojet provided a top speed of Mach 2.27. The Lightning F6 had a ferry range of 1500 km, while its combat radius was 250 km. Its service ceiling was 18,000 meters, in other words, 60,000 feet. The aircraft had two 30mm Aden cannons. The Lightning F6 had four hardpoints and could carry the Fire Streak or Red Top air-to-air -air missiles. The Lightning was one of the early examples of a jet aircraft with a cone air intake. Its engines were vertically stacked and staggered longitudinal within the fuselage to minimize frontal area, providing undisturbed engine airflow across the wide speed range. This design allowed for the thrust of two engines with the drag equivalent to only one and a half engines mounted side by side and eliminated a symmetrical thrust. The pilot could shut down one engine during the flight to increase range and endurance. Still, it was a rare practice because there would be no hydraulic power if the remaining engine failed. Later models of the Lightning had more powerful variants of the A1 turbojet engines with a full variable afterburner arrangement, so they had a special heat reflecting paint containing gold. Still, any oil leaks could quickly lead to a fire. The Royal Air Force lost 22 aircraft due to mid-air fires. The engines could be changed within 4 hours in optimum conditions. The Lightning had notched delta wings. The F-6 variant had conically cambered wings, which improved maneuverability, especially at higher altitudes. The fuselage was narrow, leading no room for the main landing gear. So, the main landing gear was sandwiched outboard of the main tanks and aft of the leading edge tanks, with the flap fuel tanks behind. The Lightning had quite narrow tires and wore out so quickly. They had to be changed every seven sorties. The number one engine was usually shut down to prevent brake wear during landing and taxiing. Still, the Lightning had an impressive climb rate. 
It was famous for its ability to rapidly rotate from takeoff to climb almost vertically from the runway. During trials in 1962, the Lightning successfully intercepted a US U-2 at up to 20,000 meters, in other words, 65,000 feet. During a NATO exercise in 1984, the aircraft also intercepted another Dragon Lady at the same altitude. During the British Airways trials in 1985, the Lightning could intercept the Concorde while the F-15, F-16, F-14, Mirage and F-104 couldn't. The Lightning's AI-23 radar had a limited range and no track while scanning capability. Besides, it could detect targets with an only a 40 degree arc. The Red Top and Fire Streak missiles quickly became obsolete. So, the UK considered supplementing or replacing them with an AIM-9L Sidewinder, but this plan was never realized due to lack of funding. The Lightning's F-1, F-1A and F-2 variants were limited to Mach 1.7. The narrow fuselage also left no room for fuel tanks, which reduced the range and endurance. It was a critical issue for an interceptor. The aircraft's later versions were fitted with an in-flight refueling probe to overcome this problem. Unlike its predecessors, the Lightning F-6 could carry jettisonable fuel tanks. Yet, they were mounted on the wing, not under, as you would expect from this extraordinary aircraft. The internal fuel capacity of this variant also increased. By the F-2 variant, it was fitted with ventral tanks. The Lightning F-3 had no cannon. Initially, the Lightning F-6 also had no guns. But later, the Aiden cannons were placed in the forward part of the ventral pack rather than in the nose. The Lightning's export variants had additional hardpoints under the outer wing and ground attack capability. They could also be fitted with a reconnaissance pod with five 70mm Type 360 Winton cameras. The Lightning's training variants had side-by-side -side seating arrangement. The British Lightnings went bear and badger hunting over the GI-UK gap countless times. However, their only air victory was against the Harrier. A Lightning of the Royal Air Force shot down a pilotless jump jet over West Germany in 1972. The pilot had abandoned the Harrier, which continued flying toward the East German border. It was shut down to avoid a diplomatic incident. Only Saudi Lightnings fought in real combat. Their presence helped seize the Egyptian air operations over Yemen. They performed many strike missions between December 1969 and May 1970. Still, one aircraft was shut down by Yemeni ground fire on May 3, 1970 during a reconnaissance mission. The Lightning was not as sexy as its rivals, such as the F-104, Mirage 3 and Draken. Yet, it was definitely charming. Its market success was limited. The Lightning was designed for only one job, interception, but its rivals had multi-role combat capability. Also, it is complex and expensive. Our viewers know that we prefer practical projects rather than the ones executed for national pride matters. Yet the UK sacrificed its aviation industry in a practical manner and has not cared about its national pride. We're not favoring this approach either. Alongside the Harrier, the Lightning became the peak of the UK's aviation industry. It was the first and last purely British designed supersonic jet. The Lightning was a legend and the Brits should have kept creating new ones. What do you think? Thanks for watching our video. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the bell button to be notified of our new videos. Also, you can now click the join button to support our channel. And as always, we would greatly appreciate all of your likes, comments and shares.